Good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee in 2024. I have received no apologies for this meeting. Today we begin our scrutiny of the assisted dying for terminally ill adult Scotland Bill at Stage 1. And by virtue of Rule 12.2.3a, uh, Liam MacArthur, MSP, is attending the meeting today as the member in charge of the Bill. And I welcome you, Liam. I'd also like to welcome Elena Whittam, the MSP, to the committee, who is replacing Ruth Maguire. And the first item on our agenda is to ask Elena to declare any relevant interests. Thank you, convener. Um, no interest to declare at this point, thanks. Thank you. The second item on our agenda is to agree to take agenda item six in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is our first evidence session as part of our scrutiny of the Assisted Dying for Terminally Ill Adult Scotland Bill at Stage 1. And we begin our scrutiny by considering the, implication, uh, the implementation of assisted dying in other jurisdictions. The first session is with those involved in the application of assisted dying law in Victoria, Australia. Um, and I welcome to the committee Julian Gardner, AM, Chairperson of Voluntary Assisted Dying Review Board, and Professor Ben White, Professor of the End of Life Law and Regulation, the Australian Centre for Health Law Research. And we've received apologies for today's meeting from Catherine Waller, who's the Project Manager for Voluntary Assisted Dying Training at the Australian Centre for Health Law Research. And we'll move straight to questions and Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Good morning uh, um, to our guests. I think can I just start with with um, a, a question around the impact of um, potentially the state of palliative care on uh, somebody's potential decision to, uh, to to take up the opportunity to have assisted dying. Uh, is there any evidence that, uh, that, that that palliative care or the state of palliative care has an impact on somebody's decision? Who would like to start? Will we start with you, Julian? If that uh, suits you, Madam Chair. Um, <coughs> the statistics in Victoria for each of the five years have been uh, that either 80 or 81 per cent of people who've accessed voluntary assisted dying have also received or are currently receiving at the time of their death palliative care. Um, so it, that is, it seems to me, quite a high number. There was a conference in Australia last week where Palliative Care Australia released the uh, information of a large survey they'd done amongst members. I don't have access to that yet, but I'm sure you could obtain it. Um, but what it did was to indicate a growing acceptance of voluntary to dying within palliative care practitioners. But I think um, more importantly, uh, they indicated that there had been an increase in demand for palliative care because they, had, they, they speculated, I think, there had been more conversations about the options for end-of-life care generally. Thank you. So, thank you. So, just to, to clarify that, um, that so you were saying that the, the palliative care providers are part of, of the process and, and have an ability to, to impact and input into the process um, <coughs> of uh, assisted dying, or, or their, 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 their opinions are sought? No, not necessarily, but a person may be receiving both palliative care and also receiving uh, voluntary assisted dying. There are some cases in which a palliative care specialist will be one of the two assessing doctors, but not necessarily. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. I mean, I, th I think you know. I think the, really the, the line of question we're looking at here uh, is around the impact that you know a, a system where palliative care is, is really good compares when uh, you know where palliative care potentially is, is not so good and the impact that would have on uh, the number of people potentially um, seeking uh, you know, to, to, to have uh, sort of this sort of end of life um, alternative, if you like. So I think that, that's really well, what we're trying well, I to think, get to. I think where it's treated here in Australia is that they're not alternatives. They're, they, they operate concurrently. So it's not an either or. If you understand, uh, so we, 
I think palliative care with Australia survey would indicate that there has been no negative in the sense of taking people away from access in palliative care. Okay, no, I think I think the, the question really is that those who potentially, you know, uh, I mean, where, where we are just now is is that not everybody, um, you know, access or has the ability to access palliative care. Um, you know, the, 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 sort of the state of palliative care in in, in, in the country. So. Given that there are potentially those who won't be able to get the palliative care potentially that they, they, would, they would need, is there any evidence potentially that's driving towards a, a, a different decision in terms of you know, ending their life? I'm not aware of any, any okay. evidence, total or empirical, to that one okay. way or the other. Okay, thank you. Our, our, yeah, sorry, go on, sir. Oh, if, if I might just be permitted to, to comment on that, that point, I agree with the points that Julian has made. Um, in Australia, there's a requirement when, as part of the process of seeking voluntary assisted dying, that people are informed about palliative care. Um, it, there's a legislative duty. So to the extent that individuals are seeking voluntary assisted dying, um, we can have confidence that they're actually aware that palliative care exists in a way that others in the community may not. And I suspect some of that is what's driving that high rate of utilisation of, of palliative care. Julian talked about an 80% figure that's replicated largely across Australia, um, so that those seeking voluntary assisted dying are highly likely to be engaged uh, and receiving palliative care. Thank you. That, that, that's actually very helpful. Uh, and just finally, convener, you know, um, just to ask it, that the people that are seeking you know, assisted dying, are they required to provide the reasons for doing so? I don't know who would like to answer that. Well, um, they, there, there are some who, who do offer statements which indicate some they're not required to, but they have to meet all of the criteria, and that is they have to be at the end of life and uh, they have to be experiencing intolerable suffering um, as well as the other eligibility requirements. But they don't actually have to say... Um, it's because of one reason rather than the other. Although some of them do, uh, some states do collect that information. In Victoria, they're not required to collect that. Thank you. Thank you, Kavina. Thank you. Uh, Paul Sweeney. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kavina. Um, just wanted to also ask in Victoria and indeed in Australia, if people can, shortly after receiving a terminal diagnosis, um, take that decision early in anticipation of their condition deteriorating over time. So, for example, in a case of, say, pancreatic cancer, where they know the normal course will ultimately lead to significant pain later in the condition as it progresses, that may lead to, for example, terminal delirium or agitation. Um, can they agree that at the point where that real deterioration takes place, they would then administer uh, the, the, the medication? Um, to end their life, so it doesn't need to be at the very point they make that decision that they have to undertake the medication or, or administer it. It can be done with the anticipation that their condition will deteriorate over time and then can have agreement with clinicians or relatives to administer it at that point. Well, I, I need to clarify the law in Victoria. The default, there are two methods by which the medication could be administered. One is self-administration, where the person has to swallow uh, some liquid. Um, the other is by practitioner administration, which involves uh, an IV uh, application. So that if you qualify and you obtain the medication, it is delivered to you and you keep it in a locked box and you have to choose when you want to take it. So in the case that you uh, outlined, you may have somebody who uh, early, so long as they meet the requirement of being within six months of death, they may have the medication and receive sufficient comfort from knowing that they've got it, that they've got autonomy and control over their life, and they may not take it straight away. They may take it in a few weeks' time, or they may not take it at all. Hmm. Is that what you were getting at? Yeah, it was just that the individual would have sovereignty after the agreement had been put in place that at any point in the progression of their condition, they could determine when to take it. Or indeed, there may be a scenario where someone enters into a state of delirium where they aren't necessarily aware of their surroundings, at what point does that sovereignty, you know, become questionable? Uh, or do they, can they have a preemptive 
understanding with relatives to help them take the drug? Uh, that's the, no. That's the, right, OK. No, ab absolutely not. Um, if it's administered by a practitioner, the, the practitioner has to be satisfied that at the time of administration they have decision-making capacity. If they possess it themselves and they um, have whatever, dementia, delirium, whatever, they lose capacity, they're not going to know they had the medication and what they have to do to mix it up and therefore they're not going to take it. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you very much. It's quite different from your bill, which, as I understand it, uh, contemplates a medical practitioner uh, being with the person every time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Professor Waite, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, not, nothing further to add. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so, so moving on, I, I wanted to ask some questions specifically about the means of, of death and, and um, the, the bill that's proposed for Scottish Parliament doesn't specify the means of death other than to say that the person will be provided with an approved substance. Um, so it doesn't specify a particular drug. Um, so I suppose I've got a, a couple of questions round about that. So how do witnesses respond to claims that the medications used in assisted dying in, in other jurisdictions have not been well researched or, is, or are evidence-based? Well, I think uh, the head of the professor who heads the pharmacy here in Victoria makes the point that 100% uh, of people who've taken the medication in whichever form have died. Um, and generally within a very short time frame, although there are outliers where they, they've lapsed into a coma quickly but, but have stayed alive for a few hours. So um, we've not had any issues in Victoria, and I'm not aware of any in other states, where the medication hasn't been totally efficacious. Okay. And is that information recorded in all of those states if it wasn't uh, totally e efficacious? Um, well, I, I assume it would be. It, uh, if, if we had a case in Victoria where that were the case, we would include that in our annual report. And I've not had any of my counterparts in other states ever talk of a case. Okay. And you, you touched on there that, that um, there have been occasions when someone hasn't died in, in, in the septimious way that we would have expected. So what are the complication rates in Victoria and Australia and what type of complications most commonly occur? Well, I don't know that I'd use the term complications. Um, the fact that somebody might take two hours to die is not considered a complication. I mean, it, it normally death occurs uh, within 30 minutes, but it's not deemed to be a complication if, if somebody takes two hours or three hours. Um, but the vast majority do occur within that shorter time frame. Okay. And in, in that, and I, I take what you say about complications, so I won't use the word complications in my next question, but if had, were there adverse events, say, for example, um, someone vomited up part of the, the medication that they'd taken and there were um, issues or difficulties, are the um, healthcare professionals around about allowed to intervene or if someone is on their own or with a, another person, as you were saying, the, um, the legislation is, is very different there. How are, how are people trained to respond to that? Is there a protocol or a guidance in place? Well, in Victoria, if you're administering, administering it yourself, you receive three medications. The first that you take about an hour advance is a, a relaxant. The second is an anti-emetic to uh, reduce the risk of regurgitation. And then the third is, is, the, is, is the one, the pentobarbital, that's going to cause your death. Um, we have had reports of people who have vomited a little bit, but it hasn't caused them not to die within the normal time frame. Um, we've had reports of people who haven't consumed all of the medication, but uh, it, it, it's of such potency that you probably only need to use a third of it anyway uh, in order to cause death. So um, none of those cases have caused what I would call an adverse event. Um, some of them may have been a bit distressing for the family present to see somebody um, uh, 
have, have a bit of a hiccup during the process of drinking the medication, but not an adverse event. Okay. I don't know if the professor wants to come in, if he's got anything that he wanted to add. So I might just mention that in Western Australia, there is uh, records of complications, as you, as you described them, and some of them include things like difficulties getting an IV line in, because of course we have both self-administration mm -hmm. and practitioner administration, um, some regurgitation of, of, of the substance, um, relatively minor events that we are talking about in the Western Australian Board Report, reports that all of the people who, despite experiencing some of these issues, um, have taken the medication and died as, as part of that. Um, so that's, I guess, one, one point to mention. A second is that one of the interesting features of the Australian system is, and, and Julian mentioned before, Professor Michael Dooley, who was the ch chief pharmacist who developed uh, the medication protocol for Australia. So where self-administration or indeed practitioner administration happens in other jurisdictions, um, sometimes there's standardised processes, sometimes there isn't. But the model in Australia from the very start was to have a medication protocol which had prescribed medication, which had prescribed steps and the times, including the ones that Julian mentioned before. So one of the upsides of that is, I, mean, I guess, that adds regulatory control. There is a consistent, systematised way that the medication uh, is taken. Um, I'm aware of a study which is not yet published, um, but I'm sure the author would be pleased to send you a copy once it's published of a, a series of uh, a study of 500 cases um, in Australia of how that protocol has been used. Um, so that I understand will be available in, in due course, but that might be some evidence which may be of interest um, to the committee. Thank you, Professor White. And before I conclude, I put on record uh, my register of interest and in that I work as a bank nurse for Great Glasgow and Clyde NHS. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Convener. Um, in terms of the substances, is it something that you keep open and as a review um, it's done independently by practitioners? Um, or is it well defined of what substances are on the face of the bill in, or the Act in Australia? They are not specified in the uh, legislation. Uh, it, the way in which you obtain a script to uh, or authority to, to write a script for the medication varies a little bit from state to state. Here in Victoria, um, once you've completed all of the, the three requests, uh, a, a permit can be issued to prescribe the medication, but the only medication that can be prescribed are those set out in the protocol. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gillian Mackay. Thanks, convener, and uh, good morning to those joining us online. The service that's currently um, set up within, within Australia and within Victoria specifically as well, is that a specialist service that has been set up to deal with um, assisted dying, or is it something that sits within um, already established healthcare services? Wonderful. Um, it uh, it isn't a specialist service, with with one exception, which I'll let Professor White talk about in New South Wales. It's simply um, a mix of general practitioners and uh, specialists who undertake the uh, prescribed training and who meet the qualification requirements in terms of length of experience and admission to a uh, college of specialists. Um, and, and these may be uh, medical practitioners who are employed in public hospitals or they may be just in private practice. So Ben, just, would you like to talk about New South Wales? Yeah, just picking up on, on what Julian said. Um, so, yes, in other states there is a specific service which was set up, so both in uh, New South Wales, as Gillian mentioned, and also in Queensland, a specific service which is able to assess eligibility and provide voluntary assisted dying if that is required. I think the model is ideally it's provided locally, so that would happen within the, the public setting or in the private setting where the person lives, but to ensure statewide access and in particular in a, in a big place like Australia and some of the states like Queensland and others uh, have got a very large geographical area to cover. So uh, there's called, it's called Queensland VAD, Voluntary Assisted Dying uh, Support and Pharmacy Service. So it's an integrated service. 
and as part of its function, if there is not local capability, if there are not practitioners who could assess eligibility in a particular area, then that service is able to travel, meet with the patients, um, assess them for eligibility and so on. So that there is a, a specialised service, but it is more about covering off um, statewide access where that is needed. It's not the, the starting point, if that makes sense. So if I'm understanding... Okay, can I May I just quickly add to that? Uh, we do have a specialist pharmacy, though, that is centralised and government run, who deliver the medication no matter where you live, free of charge. Uh, we also have a specialist service that in Victoria we call care navigators. These are generally nurses um, who do a lot of the liaison to try and ensure that people have got access, uh, overcome access difficulties. But sorry for interrupting. No, not at all. That's very useful, thank you. Um, Professor White, just coming back to what you said about where there is a specialist um, service, is it purely rura rurality and the, the, size of, um, the size of state that they have to cover for the establishment of that, um, that specialist service? Or were there other considerations in there as well? So in Queensland, um, when that service was initially st established, that idea of that outreach and, and ensuring statewide access was not actually contemplated as part of, of that body's role, um, but it became clear that there was a need. There was, um, for example, some remote areas which didn't have access to practitioners who could assess voluntary assisted dying. Hence, that centralised service, which includes both the pharmacy and the navigators that Julian mentioned, um, stepped in to do that role. New South Wales was the last Australian state to pass laws. Um, and it, Actually, it set up a, an access service which did have that designated role right from the start. But the focus is on, um, I guess, ensuring access where local access is not possible. It's not the default. It's not that voluntary assisted dying is provided by this service. Wherever you are and, and when, you know, whatever part of the state you might live, it's if you don't have practitioners in your area who are able to assist or there's no one who's able to provide voluntary assisted dying. That's <laughs> That's great, thank you. Um, Julian, just coming back to what, what you said a couple of minutes ago about, about the training that pr practitioners um, receive, could you give us an overview of what that, that training looks like? Does it vary by, by state or is it um, set out within the, the legislation that's, that's provided in Australia? No, in, in Victoria, um, the Secretary of the Department of Health uh, specifies the training, but I'm going to defer to Professor White because we contracted him and his expert team to prepare and deliver the training in Victoria and indeed in some of the other states. So you couldn't talk to a better person than, than Professor White. That's great, thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, yes, I will endeavour to answer the question. I acknowledge that our project manager, Kat Waller, unfortunately could not join us tonight, but she manages that overall project. Um, I guess to disclose, as Julian mentioned, we designed and delivered the training in Queensland, Western Australia, and um, Victoria. Um, so the training does vary slightly, but I guess thinking about it at a sort of global level, um, it's training which generally takes about six hours. And the goal is to make sure that all practitioners who are involved in providing voluntary assisted dying understand the eligibility criteria. They understand how the process would work. They understand the oversight process and reporting. Um, so the goal is that anyone who's providing voluntary assisted dying has done the training, there's an assessment component which is attached. So uh, anyone who's involved in that process will have that sort of baseline level of knowledge uh, about voluntary assisted dying. That's great, thank you. And what level of resource was provided to, um, to healthcare providers to be able to upskill and train um, clinicians in that, in that first instance when voluntary assisted dying came online? So do you mean, um, apart from that, um, the training which was provided, provided it was provided free of charge by the state, but of course, um, folks were not, uh, practitioners were not necessarily funded to do that training. Some of that, I imagine, was done in their time. Is, is that the yes. sorts of Yeah, questions? that's... Yeah, so, um, yeah, most practitioners did that in their own time. I guess there are CPD and other continuing professional development and other requirements that practitioners have. Um, that is not the case in, in all places in the world. Sometimes practitioners are, are given funding to be able to complete that training. And certainly that it was not funded 
um, was perhaps a, a disincentive to do the training. Uh, about six hours of training is a, is a big ask in terms of practitioners. So one of the, the balancing questions I think with when thinking about training is, uh, yes, it is an important safeguard and it gives confidence that we know there's a baseline level of knowledge, but at the same time, we need to make sure it is as accessible and possible for practitioners to do in, in a busy practice. That's great. Thanks, convener. Sanjay Gohani. Thank you. Um, just to declare my register of interest of practicing NHS GP, and also uh, particularly for this bill, I, I was chairing a steering group. Um, so can I just pick up a little bit more about training, please? Um, so we've got a baseline of knowledge, Professor White. Uh, is there a, a requirement for uh, an annual review or, or um, an annual oversight of, of that training? So the approach taken um, has been to require, um, and it does vary state by state, but the states that we've been involved in has been to require a renewal of that training to be done after three years. Um, the process to get accredited is a, a rigorous process. Um, the Department of Health uh, in those three states set the pass rate for the assessment at 90%. So the, the, the benchmark was set very high and it, was, it is a rigorous course. So the view was that um, having done that after three years, that would be an appropriate period of time to do a renewal of that training. And there is a more focused um, uh, renewal training project uh, package, if you like, in each of those states. The thinking being that if someone's been providing voluntary assisted dying for three years, um, then by way of refresher, maybe a more appropriate than spending the entire six hours. Um, but there is also scope if someone hasn't practiced voluntary assisted dying that period to redo that as part of a refresher for themselves as well, the complete package. Okay. And when is there a different amount of training required for the different parts uh, of what happens? So, for example, your care coordinator or the doctor that would end, would administer the medications, is there a bespoke version of that training for, for those people? The training for all who are involved in providing assisted dying, and, and by providing I would mean uh, doing the, the first assessment, the second assessment, and in Australia we also have provision for an administering practitioner. So someone, once the person's assessed as eligible, is able to do the practitioner administration. They all do the same training. Um, each of the states, not all of them, but many of them also produced a shorter training package or anyone else who may be involved in voluntary assisted dying more generally. So for example, in Queensland, all healthcare workers, so that's the full spectrum of those involved in health, were provided access to a free 45 minute training program um, to, to ensure that people knew what voluntary assisted dying was, how it worked. And if you don't wanna be involved, for example, you're a conscientious objector, it's important to know what your rights and responsibilities are as well. So that there was a second sort of more generic training package as well. Thank you. And can I ask um, about workload? Um, is this in, in, in Australia something that is provided by independent practitioners who, who do this um, in particular, or is it added on to um, the role that other that, that you would do, for example, as a, as a general practitioner here? I, I would say there's a high degree of variability as to how that operates. So I guess the first point to make is that the Commonwealth Government in Australia, um, through its, its funds, uh, the provision of health services, um, it excludes some aspects of the voluntary assisted dying process. That's largely a historical thing when voluntary assisted dying was not lawful and there was uh, ex suggestions about excluding that. There are still some publicly funded funds that can be claimed for conversations or some of those sorts of things. So. Public funding uh, is relatively limited for those providing it within the public health sector. Sometimes they're given additional workload, sometimes they aren't. And for practitioners in private practice, sometimes they charge independently. So sometimes they charge private billing um, and sometimes they don't as well. So I'm sorry, that's a little bit of an unhelpful answer, but there is a high degree of variability across both public and private and also state by state because for example, in Queensland, about 90% of voluntary assisted dying happens through the public system, where it's, it's a much more even spread across other states. So it, high degree of variability. Thank you. My, my final question, if I may. Um, 
If, I just want to sort of really do look at focus on workload because obviously your system is very different to ours. We don't we don't charge here in the United Kingdom. Um, when you, how many people per capita would you say would undergo this process? Not not completed the process, but at least start the process um, so that we could maybe try to work out what that workload would mean um, over here. So on that, I probably would think about um, the board reports. So they include figures of, of two types, and, and one's probably a, a sort of easier shorthand one to, th to think about. And there's been calculations on the percentage of deaths that occur in each of the states through voluntary assisted dying. And that varies from about 0.8 through to up to sort of almost 2 2%. You rightly say that, of course, there is a cohort of people who apply for voluntary assisted dying or make inquiries about voluntary assisted dying, but don't end up dying through that path. But in terms of those calculations that you're suggesting, I think those would be those the two data points to, to look at. One would be that the percentage of deaths, but also the VAD reports, um, and Julian may wish to comment on this, also include um, uh, the, the number of first requests, which is the initiation process for voluntary assisted dying. Thank you very much. Yes, if you take if you take the Victorian figures, which uh, we have a very low uh, usage compared to other states, so only 0.84 percent of all deaths in Victoria are voluntary assisted dying. Um, without my calculator in my head, looking at first assessments, that would be about 1.9 percent of. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think, 1.9% of deaths, so that's not the same as 1% of population. So, Nori, I can't give you the figure as percentage of population that do a first assessment. But I can say this, um, there are concerns that uh, a number of medical practitioners find it very difficult to find the time, particularly in a very busy GP practice, to do this. And, and that is a disincentive. And we do have a concern that we're over-reliant upon a very a small cohort that do a very large number of cases. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, can I ask, um, one of the key provisions of the bill is aimed at safeguarding, um, and it is a requirement of the assessing doctor to form an opinion on whether or not the person has been subject to any pressure. I just wondered if there have been cases where anything has been picked up in that regard, and if you feel that there is a, you know, a, a robust process within your structures to ensure that we do pick anything up, um, or at least have those conversations <coughs> with people who may be choosing to go down this route. The, the system is very much reliant upon the two assessing medical practitioners. If they form the view that there is no evidence of uh, undue influence or coercion or abuse, then uh, we have no way of really, as a review board, assessing how they did that, how they, they came to that conclusion. What we do do, though, is talk to a reasonable percentage of family members and uh, uh, after the event, and we have not had in the five years in Victoria any reports of that nature. The only reports we have had have been the reverse, and that is where people have um, experienced coercion, maybe that's too strong a word, but, but undue influence not to go ahead with it, generally from relatives who, who have objections uh, or, or from institutions that uh, may be faith-based. But uh, as I say, we do not uh, have any way of assessing how individual medical practitioners come to that conclusion. Th thank you. Um, I wonder if, Professor, you spoke about the training just in, in my previous colleague. Is there is there parts of the training that look at picking up on those elements? Absolutely. Um, that is an area of, of focus because that's obviously part of the eligibility criteria. So there is a specific component which is focused on uh, training doctors about detecting coercion, sorts of conversations to have. Um, and of course, we should recognise that um, these are conversations which medical doctors are having with patients in other end of life decisions. Um, the idea of assessing capacity and making sure this is the decision that the person wants to make, these are things which doctors do 
uh, routinely in end of life practice. Um, and I guess probably that the final point I, I might make just to build on, on Julian's comments, um, voluntary assisted dying in Australia is the most scrutinised end of life decision that there is. Um, there are decisions to withhold or withdraw life sustaining treatment, there's palliative sedation, there's a range of other end of life decisions which don't have anything like this scrutiny. For voluntary assisted dying to occur, you need not only one doctor, but a second independent doctor who will have a, a separate conversation on their own with that patient to explore all of these issues. Um, and as Julian said, um, it is the doctors who, who do that. And the chair of the Western Australian board actually talks about the people and the system are the safeguards, that doctors play a really important safeguarding role from the interviews that we did with um, doctors who provide voluntary assisted dying, this is something they see as a very grave and significant decision. Um, allowing someone to take the next step to have voluntary assisted dying is something that is very, very serious. Um, and so they're very careful and, and cautious with that. So those are just the other points that I, that I would make in the setting of, of coercion. Um, perhaps, sorry, one final thing. We also interviewed family members and a patient as well as part of our research. Um, one of the things that came through very loud and clear was, uh, indeed, some of the family caregivers said, um, reported their loved ones saying, if I have to be asked again, if this is what I really want. So every time they met with someone, it just... So I guess I, I took a great deal of confidence from how strong that theme was, that everyone was so keen to make sure this is really what you want. Are you sure this is what you want? Um, I took confidence from that. Can I come in with just one last question around... Often, as um, elected members here, people say that um, people may wish to go down this road because they road because they feel a burden on their family or on medical practitioners that are being so caring with them. Um, and I just wonder, to be clear from what you're saying earlier on in the evidence session, you have very robust systems in place to make sure people know all the options available to them in terms of palliative care and what support is there and easily accessed for people? I don't know. So that, that's one of the requirements in the law um, in terms of, so when someone's being assessed for voluntary assisted dying, they have to be given information about other treatment options, including palliative care. So they form part of every discussion in each of those eligibility um, assessments. Thank you, convener. Thank you. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, can the witnesses provide an overview to the extent to which assistance with assistance dying is allowed by our laws in Victoria and the rest of Australia and the form of this assistance can take? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by assistance, but let me have a go at, at having a guess. Uh, in Victoria, if you um, receive the administration to administer yourself, somebody else is allowed to actually mix it up and but you and only you can hold the glass and lift the glass to your lips they can't assist you in any other way but they can assist you in taking the medication that's not the case in every state for example in western australia um uh, that's not allowed as i understand it um is that what you meant by assistance um yes if can I, can I just say, if somebody had a physical impairment and they couldn't lift a glass to yes. their mouth themselves, if somebody if is well, on to help... Well, in that case, it, it, once again, the, the law varies around... Unfortunately, we have a federation. Don't ever become a federation. Um, in Victoria, if you're unable to physically raise the glass or physically unable to ingest the medication, then you are eligible to have a practitioner give you an injection. So that is how we get around that. In other states, to varying degrees, you've got a choice as to which way you want the medication, whether you want to take it yourself or have a doctor do it. So, yes, but you can't have somebody help you lift it to the... Lift it up. I wonder if the professor has any comments? Oh, no, nothing further to, to add on that, other than I, I note... Um, and, and I, maybe I've not fully understood the, the bill proposed in Scotland, but it, I understood it to be self-administration only. And I, I guess thinking about the issues that, that Julian had raised, um, there is that cohort of people for whom 
self-administration may be challenging. And I recognise self-administration can happen in different ways, but that was certainly an important consideration uh, in Australia because I think originally the the starting point was to, to think only about self-administration, but in Victoria it became very clear that there was this cohort of people who may not be able to access that if they had a physical disability. And so to avoid discrimination on the basis of physical disability, the option of practitioner administration where self-administration was not possible became part of, of the debates and the discussion of the Victorian law. Can I just add to that? Um, it is also uh, possible in Victoria to administer it yourself via a nasogastric tube or a peg tube. Thank you. I'm just wondering if you keep statistics on the proportion of those seeking assisted dying that have a physical impairment which would prevent them from self-administration. Well, um, in Victoria, because that's the only way in which you can get um, a practitioner to administer it, you, you have to have a, a physical limitation. Now, we're not necessarily talking somebody who's already had a physical disability. We're talking about people who, because of the, the condition from which they're suffering, can't. Um, at, at present, the, the, the figures in Victoria that 18% um, of, uh, of people who um, take the medication, it's done by means of a practitioner administering it. So you could reasonably conclude from that that they either had a physical limitation or they were unable, for example, of particular forms of cancer. You just can't swallow the medication. So it, that figure doesn't... I can't separate, though, the unable to ingest from the unable to physically administer but. Whereas in other states, you have more of a choice, so their figures wouldn't reveal that, that information for you. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Emma Harper. Thanks, thanks, convener. Um, it, Professor White mentioned earlier about conscientious objection, and uh, I've had um, a particular constituent uh, contact me about that um, as a health professional um, themselves. So I'm interested to know a bit more about how the law in Victoria provides for the option of conscientious objection. Um, there's issues around whether it's providing information and support or assessing a person for voluntary assisted dying or even supplying the, the, medi the medication. So that would be pharmacists and nurses I'm thinking about. So are you able to maybe just tell me a little bit more about how the law works in Victoria and elsewhere about supporting persons who conscientiously object? Julian, I can probably start on this one. Yeah, I think, Ben, you can do the overview. <laughs> OK, all right. Um, so there is some variation across Australia. So the starting point, of course, is that conscientious objection is um, strongly and clearly protected in all the legislation in all, all Australian jurisdictions. Um, that is clearly stated and set out as a specific section um, in each of the acts to make that clear. There is some difference about what people with conscientious objections when they're asked about voluntary assisted dying need to do. Um, in Victoria, for example, there is no legal requirement. This is not required in the Act itself for them to do anything further uh, in terms of share, uh, referring or providing information. So that has led to, so in some of the interviews that we've done, um, a patient asking their GP about voluntary assisted dying, and they said, no, I don't want to talk about that. I'm, I'm a conscientious objector. And then that's the end of the conversation. And that person is then left with a dead end because, well, that's my GP and, and they're quite not quite sure how they're going to find voluntary assisted dying. In some other states, and Queensland I give as an example, um, there is, again, strong protection for conscientious objection, but there is a minimal requirement when someone receives a first request, for example, I would, I would like voluntary assisted dying. If you're a conscientious objector, there is a requirement to at least share information about the Care Navigator service that we discussed before. So it would be as simple as here's a phone number and this is the Voluntary Assisted Dying Care Navigator service. So I think that model um, provides uh, better access for patients because it can be difficult to navigate. It's one of the barriers that's been identified in Victoria. So having that minimal requirement just ensures connection to the, the system. So that those are broadly the ways in which it's been handled here in Australia. Okay, thanks. Um, 
And I forgot to mention that I also have an interest in the fact that I'm still a registered nurse in perioperative um, department and clinical education was um, my experience. Um, just a final question. Has there been any assessment on staff who have either felt pressure to participate in voluntary assisted dying or um, when they've actually really been firmly uh, conscientiously objecting? I've not come across that in my research. Um, and so in the work that we've done or the work that I have, I've read, um, I think one of the things that's happened in health services as part of their education to staff, I mean, that's one of the sort of first sort of threshold issues. Do you want to participate or not? And I think that's been very, very clear in um, the rollout of the law. And one of the things I should mention in Australia, all of the jurisdictions had a designated implementation period. So in some places, the, the law has started and then voluntary assisted dying is available the next day. In Australia, the law was passed and then there was generally an 18 month implementation period. And a big part of that was establishing structures and systems in health systems, um, including the discussion that I guess we're having now about conscientious objection. So I haven't come across um, that in, in my research. That's not to say the individuals haven't felt that way, but that's not something that I've, I've come across today. Julian, I don't know if you've had evidence of that either. No, I uh, haven't had any instances. The only one I had was involved the opposite, which was where the head of a clinical unit was uh, a conscientious objector and was causing great difficulties for staff. But uh, I haven't had it the other way around. Mm, OK, thanks. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask a bit about how the legislation has developed um, since it's come into force, particularly in Victoria, where it's been in force now for, I think, nearly five years. Um, some people are concerned that when the legislation gets um, brought in, if it gets brought in in, in Scotland, then there's an, inevit an inevitable, um, as they, they say, slippery slope um, to expansion. Um, but on the other side, when we pass legislation in a new area, we would expect there to, that legislation to be reviewed and finessed. So I wonder if you could tell us, in, particularly in terms of, I think, Victoria, but maybe about how the, the laws developed elsewhere in Australia too, whether there have been changes to the um, eligibility criteria, has it been expanded, contracted, um, and, uh, and also to the, the safeguards around the legislation when it was first brought in in Victoria, have this, the safeguards been made more robust or relaxed? And I, I guess the final area would be um, in, in terms of numbers, has there been, um, you know, how have the numbers changed over, over time? Has there been a massive increase or is it stabilised? Uh, well, Victorian legislation has been in operation for five and a quarter years. There have been no changes to the Act at all. Um, I suppose you could argue that because we were the first state and there had been, I think, 51 bills in various state parliaments in Australia before one was successful, um, the other states mainly have, I think, learned from some of our lessons. They, in my view, have not made the eligibility criteria any wider, but they have removed some of the um, unnecessary restrictions we have in Victoria. For example, in Victoria, we have a, a doctor is not allowed to raise the topic. You have to raise it yourself. So, but in, in most other states, the doctor can, so long as they tell you about every other option, including palliative care, can say, well, look, there are many options for end-of-life care. This is one of them. So to that extent, there has been have been improvements in the other states, but there have been no changes to the Act. The slippery slope, we heard all about that uh, when we were doing the consultation for the legislation here in Victoria. Um, I mean, I think you could look at Oregon. How many years has it been in now, Ben? Is it 30 or 40? And I think they've had two minor amendments, neither of which you could say broadened it. So you're never going to positively say that a future government, what it will or won't do, but um, there's certainly no evidence of it. And, and just to confirm, that is the position across um, all of the Australian states. So the law is still as it was passed at that time. Um, the Victorian law is being reviewed, um, but I guess relevant to your uh, question, uh, the Victorian government has publicly stated that they will not be reopening the law. So um, there is a review, um, but the public statements to date have been that that law will not be changing. Okay, thank you. 
Sandish Kohani. Thank you, convener. Um, <laughs> could I ask what your minimum age is for eligibility? Uh, in Australia, uh, you become an adult at the age of 18, and that's uniform across all states. And why was 18 chosen as the number? It might have been just what you said because, there, but... Well, because that's the age at which you become an adult in Australia. So, um, uh, yes, the, 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 simply to make it consistent with all other laws about adulthood. OK, thank you very much. Emma Harper? I think I'm OK. Um, convener, I've got my questions answered. Elena Bell. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to our witnesses. Um, before I ask a few questions I have, I would like to declare an interest that I am a member of uh, Humanist Society Scotland, and I'm also a member of the End of Life Choices cross-party group in the Parliament. Um, Professor White, you've spent um, a lot of your career researching voluntary assisted dying, um, and obviously you're here today to speak to us in that capacity. I'm wondering if you can give us your views on um, the Scottish Bill as drafted. What has it got right? Um, and perhaps where could it be improved? You've already mentioned a little bit there about um, the concerns you had um, with the discrimination based on disability, and that's why there's, you have slightly different administration routes um, in Australia. But I wonder if you could speak to that, please. Um, yes, of course. Um, so I, we, uh, with my colleague, Lindy Wilmot, we did make a submission to the, uh, the committee, which sort of touches on some of this, but I might, um, I guess, just pull out some of those points. Um, the self-administration one is, is one, I guess, that I, I would mention. Um, the ability of um, all people to be able to access voluntary assisted dying, even if they may have a physical disability, if that is their choice, I, I think is an important consideration. Um, one of the things that I think is really significant and valuable in the bill is that it has removed uh, one of the challenges that we have in Australia about timeframes. So in Australia, we have this... Um, variation of either six or 12 months, depending on the nature of your illness or which uh, state you live in. Um, the ACT has taken a similar approach to Scotland in that it does not ha have a specific time frame for eligibility. I make that observation in the context of eligibility criteria operating holistically. So this is someone who has an advanced progressive illness that's reached that advanced stage. Uh, for an illness that's going to cause their death. So we are talking about a cohort of terminally ill people, but removing the arbitrary nature of whether it's you know, six months or eight months or 12 months, um, I think is a, a significant step forward in the Scottish Bill. So that, that is one area I did want to mention uh, as being a, a positive. Um, we did also suggest that perhaps the use of the word premature death in that relative uh, eligibility it was unclear to Lindy and I what value the word premature would offer, and we thought it could potentially um, add confusion. So, you know, whether or not a death is premature depends on a range of considerations, such as life expectancy, the progression of the illness, and, and we didn't think it necessarily added value. So that's one of the issues um, that we might mention. And maybe just one more, if I, if I may, and I'm, I'm happy to follow up with some further written thoughts if that would be useful as well. One of the things that the Scottish Bill doesn't uh, address, that is the issue of the of institutional objection. Um, in Australia, we have uh, the first sort of series of, of laws did not mention institutional objection, and it was a problem in practice. Um, in a different way from con uh, individual conscientious objection, where it's just one person, you can navigate around that. If you are in an institution which as a whole does not allow voluntary assisted dying to happen, that can be have significant issues the subsequent three states and indeed the Australian Capital Territory have specifically dealt with um, institutional objection in the legislation to create a framework which makes sure that patients don't miss out, um, regardless of where they may be cared for. There's some variation across the state uh, and territory laws, um, but also aims to respect institutional views. So that is one area where, um, having seen some of the challenges it can cause in practice, that, that I might raise for consideration in relation to the, the Scottish Assisted Dying Bill. Thanks very much for that, Professor Wright. I have an, another further question for you then. I wonder maybe... Uh, oh, Julian, if you want to come in. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah, Do you mind? I'm sorry, Brett. Yeah, there was one that I would like to draw your attention to, and that is the requirement that there be a 14-day period 
um, between the start of the process and the end of uh, and get going ahead. Um, here it is uh, nine days, although in New South Wales it's only five. I'm just going to bore you with some statistics. Of those who have a first assessment in Victoria, 34% die before they get to the point of having the medication dispensed. Of those who die without medication, 60% die within 14 days of the first assessment. So um, you can shorten that period, as you can in your bill. In um, Queensland and WA, I was told last week that 25% of their cases involve a request to shorten the nine-day period. So unless you have some vastly different health system, I would suspect that the majority of people who seek your, this end-of-life care would die before they ever got the medication because 14 days is too long. Thank you for that. That's um, very helpful. Um, you both have actually answered a couple of the other questions that I had, but I have one final question, and I guess that would, yeah, that would be um, round about the safeguarding. So is there anything that, if we get to the amending stage with this bill, is there anything that you would caution us about um, putting in place? We've already mentioned round about some of the time frames, the so-called gagging um, clause, etc. Is there anything that you would seek this committee to look at or think about um, if we got to that stage? Look, uh, the process here is very bureaucratic. It has a large number of safeguards. It, it is because, as, as Ben said, this is a very serious form of medical treatments and, and it's a very difficult area because of the interface between law and medicine. Um, so I'm not quite sure that I'd point to any other safeguards particularly. I mean, we do have uh, one that is a problem and that, like you have a, in the bill, requirement that you have 12 months residence in Scotland. We have the same. What has happened is that we've discovered people as they become close to death move back home to be with family. And so you may well have people who come from south of the border in order to have the support of their family who become ineligible because of that. So you may need to have something which says an exemption could be granted in special circumstances. And I might just briefly make a global point about that next stage that you mentioned. I think sometimes the temptation, because we are talking about a serious issue, um, parliamentarians can focus so heavily on safety that we can sometimes forget about access. And I think one of the, the um, challenges, I think, with the Australian models generally is there was so much focus on safety and safeguards that sometimes there wasn't debate and consideration to make sure actually that this law is capable of being used. So I guess that means each time a new safeguard is proposed, it's worth thinking, well, is that issue already addressed? Does this safeguard materially make things safer or is it just making it harder for voluntary assisted dying to be accessed? So that, that's a sort of global consideration for each of um, further debates or discussions about, hey, we should add a new safeguard. Um, I think sometimes they can end up with a model that's very unwieldy and unworkable without being safer. Thank you. A very brief supplementary from Brian Whittle. Thank, thank you much, Commissioner. Yeah, and it's it is quite brief. And I just wanted to clarify um, how you defined, managed to get to a position of defining what a terminal condition is, and, and was there any pressure from a cohort outside of that definition to be included? Um, well, because in, uh, in most cases, and certainly in Victoria, the two doctors have to form the view that the condition is likely or is expected, to, sorry, not likely, is expected to cause death within six months or in a case of a neurodegenerative condition, 12 months. So um, I think that's one way that you could say the term terminal uh, has, has been prescribed. Um, in terms of pressure from outside, of, well, the, the, the debate, which I'm sure is not going to go anything, go anywhere in the short term, is in relation to people with dementia. Um, because sadly, uh, during the course of that uh, condition, at some point you're likely to lose capacity and therefore uh, become ineligible. So that's the only area where we've seen any pressure to expand the nature of terminal. 
And I might just comment that um, the Australian model is is premised on a terminal illness. That's really been, um, I, I guess, the focus of, we've been through seven reform processes across the states and territories, and no other model other than a, a focus on terminal illness uh, has been proposed. Can I thank uh, Professor White and also Julian Gardner AM for their attendance at committee this morning. Um, I hope you would be receptive to committee writing to you if we have further questions about thank you very much. I see you're nodding agreement yes. there. Um, and yep. can I wish you both a very good evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. The fourth item on our agenda is consideration of one negative instrument, registration of births, deaths and marriages, Scotland Act. 1965, Prohibition on Disposal of a Body Without Authorisation Amendment Regulations 2024. The purpose of the instrument is to amend Regulations 4 and 5 of the Registration of Births, Deaths and Marriages Scotland Act 1965, Prohibition on Disposal of a Body Without Authorisation Regulations 2015, so that a person who has died in England, Wales or Northern Ireland and whose death is subject to a coroner investigation, can be buried or cremated in Scotland with the consent of the coroner before the conclusion of the coroner investigation and prior to death registration. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the instrument at its meeting on the 29th of October 2024 and made no recommendations in relation to this instrument. No motion to annul has been received in relation to the instrument and I ask members if they have any comments. I propose that the committee does not make any recommendations in relation to this negative instrument. Does any member disagree with this? Thank you. At our next meeting on Monday the 11th of November, we will continue taking oral evidence as part of the committee's stage one scrutiny of the Assisted Dying for Terminally Ill Adults Scotland Bill. And that concludes the public part of our meeting today. <laughs>